star of the show, and that's John Alley. Good President, morning. CEO, Woodlawn Hospital. Pleasure to be here. Hey, nice to have you back with us. And, of course, you had a board meeting yesterday. Yes, had our uh, November board meeting. And, again, we're, we're, I'm starting to like these. They're getting shorter and shorter. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's, that's kind of a good thing. That means I guess we're doing things right. Doing a good a lot, job. Not, that's right. A lot right. going on. Uh, cover some, you know, some things, uh, housekeeping things we have to do. Uh, you know, any of our major purchases in the hospital have to be board approved. Okay. And, uh, you know, so we did look at a, uh, a, what's called a portable ultrasound. Dr. Seward's our new OBGYN, and he's wanting one of these for his office. So, you know, when you start looking at the benefits this brings to his practice is right now, if a patient needs an ultrasound, you know, we'd have to schedule it. They go down to the radiology department on, you know, they have to come back in for that. Results in his office, they have to come back in to get that. So, it, you know, it's a three-trip. See the doctor, come back to the hospital, back to the doctor. Now, with him having a portable ultrasound in his office, it's a one-shop. Patient come in, he can do the ultrasound, get the results to the patient right away. So, uh, we see a you know vast benefit to the patient satisfaction, and it helps Dr. Seward in his practice. Exactly. And side benefit of this, if at night we need an ultrasound in the OB department itself, this unit is portable. Right now, the one downstairs is not. So we can now just, you know, take that over to the OB department and help with the delivery. So I think it's a very worthwhile purchase. And, it, you know, it's going to add to his practice. And what we hope is add to that experience for the, the ladies that come in uh, for their OB. Save them some time, some trouble. Uh, get that done right in the office and not have to make multiple trips for that. Dr. Seward has been doing the Doc Talk program, of course, for the last yes. couple of months. He's very interesting to listen to in terms of his medical knowledge, and I can see how that would fit in very much with his practice. Yeah, because he, he likes to do a lot of education with the patients. Exactly. So if he's got that report right there, or while he's doing the ultrasound, he can share a lot of things with the patient right away instead of, you know, looking to report, bringing them back in. So we just uh, see this as a very good benefit, not only for him, but for that patient. Save him some time, save him some driving. Okay. Uh, also, one of the other things that we had to approve, and it was one of those we have to run it through the board, but we have to do it no matter what, is there were some changes that the government made on how we are to report items to, to the federal government each year. So we have to upgrade part of our IT infrastructure, some new uh, servers, new software. And, uh, you know, once you start getting servers and software, it's not very <laughs> cheap. But there are some requirements uh, that our current system just won't handle. It doesn't have the horsepower to do that. So Travis Albright did make that presentation to the board to, you know, get their approval. And it was, you know, one of the board members said, what if we don't approve it? And uh, you know, we kind of told him so, but well, then we stopped getting paid. So <laughs> that kind of changed the mind pretty quick at that point. Uh, that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. So, yeah, it is one of those requirements where the, the government does say, we want this reporting requirements, new software, new uh, hardware to make, uh, make us able to do that starting in 2018. So we're hoping to have all the, the stuff in. And, uh, you know, that's my technical IT knowledge is it's stuff. Uh, but there's a lot of servers and other things that go with us. So it sounds like a fairly major project uh, for our IT department. And that's what they went to school for. I'm going to let them do that and keep my hands <laughs> off from it. Kind of the last thing before we got into the financials was uh, the budget for 2018 was it been given to the board for them to look over. So they did approve that yesterday. It's a fairly conservative budget. Um, you know, we're, I think we're projecting about a three hundred thousand uh, dollar income in 2018. And what we're seeing there is we're probably going to experience a little more in the bad debts and write offs along that line. Because of a lot of the, the insurance plans are discontinuing the state of Indiana at the end of the year. Anthem's one of the big and, ones. Yes. A lot of the folks are pulling out of the what they call, you know, the Obamacare or the pool or whatever you want to call it. Sure. Just because, you know, be honest, they weren't making enough money on it. So they, you know, they're discontinuing those products. So some of those folks who did have insurance, we anticipate they will not again have insurance. And that, uh, you know, unfortunately, health care is very expensive. Uh, you know, even though I work in the industry, it's expensive. And, uh, you know, there's no easy solution to solve that problem right now. I think long term, if everybody would start working together, we could find a solution, but it's just not going to happen quickly. So we've added a little more dollars in there for uh, our write-offs, I think, as we anticipate more folks coming off insurance, more self-pay, and they just can't afford the cost of health care. You know, and the side note to that is, you know, even though you can't afford it, still come to see us. Uh, we will treat you whether you can afford it or not. I mean, that's part of, you know, our goal to serve this community and everybody here is whether you can pay for it or not, we're going to treat you. Uh, that's what we have to do. It's the right thing to do. Well said. Then we finally got into our financials for October. We had uh, just a little over $12 million in gross revenue. Uh, 
First, our deductions from revenue was $7.3 million. So that kind of left us about $4.9 million of, of cash to play with. That's a spendable money. And uh, we spent four point seven of it. So it left us a $244,000 profit for the month. And we usually start seeing, as we get into the later months in the year, you know, those summer months was kind of lean. We usually have some losses. Uh, the winter months, we start recovering that. And we're still hoping that we'll have close to a break even by we get through the end of December. Okay. So, uh, you know, we still got the November and December yet financials to get done. So we're, you know, if we're projecting and uh, look at that crystal ball, we're hoping to see a, a positive bottom number uh, as we close out the year in December. And that was pretty well the board meeting. Uh, again, fairly short. Uh, you know, we did some education we, with the new board member coming on. Uh, some of the acronyms, you know, we're so used to. You know, he kind of has that deer in the headlight look. So we're trying to, you know, not use the acronyms anymore and actually say, you know, what the word means instead of using the just the little abbreviation. So it takes a, it takes a while to get up to speed it, as a hospital board member. It takes a while. It's uh, you know, it's unlike any other business. And you know, about the best thing I can tell people: if you run a normal business, think the opposite. And that's about how we have to operate. And uh, so it does take time to get that learning curve up. And uh, you know, we're you know open to any time the new board member wants to come in, just sit down and go over things outside of the board meeting. You know, doors always open and, uh, cause that does help them understand a little quicker, but it's, it's confusing. And I, you know, I've been in healthcare, healthcare a long time. I, you know, I've always said it takes two to three years for a board member to truly understand how it operates and what's going on. And, uh, so that's why we like for our board members to be, you know, have longer tenures because their first few years, it's wow, this is confusing. It doesn't make sense. Once they start understanding it, then that helps them, you know, make those suggestions as we look strategically to move forward uh, with the hospital. John, I know when uh, talking about financials, one of the things we've talked about pretty much each month all year long has been the percentage of write-offs that we have to do to the gross income. How are we coming with that? It, it's hanging in there, you know, a little over 60%. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things we'd like to do, we'd like to get that under a 60%. And that, you know, some of that's tough to do because of when we look at our governmental contracts, our Medicare, Medicaid, that's a fixed rate. Uh, that's non-negotiable. They pay us what they pay us and, and we move on. So we, you know, try to work with some of our commercial payers and you know get better contracts with them but we you know they come in and say for us to allow our insurers to come to your facility you have to give us a discount and so we're playing that discount game and then the unfortunate part who gets caught up in that is those folks who don't have insurance because quite honestly we're like any other healthcare provider out there we know what we have to have at the bottom line so that as we have to give bigger and bigger discounts our gross charges go higher and higher to make up for that. And that the poor person without insurance, the self-pay, they're caught in that, that middle. And we try to work with them the best we can and, and, you know, allow them those discounts too. But it's just a, it's, it's a never ending vicious cycle that, you know, I wish I had that crystal ball. I could look and say, here's the solution to that, where everybody pays us what we bill them. There's no discounts <laughs> and we could move on. And, you know, under that perfect world, we could discount every charge in the hospital approximately 62% if I knew everybody would pay me what I bill them. But we know there's folks that can't pay, so those who can't pay, we don't charge. Those who can pay, you know, are helping to subsidize those folks who unfortunately can't pay for their health care. John, folks who have questions about insurance, maybe don't have insurance, but would like to look into it, you do have the office. We still have on. the claim aid office there just right next to the cashier's window. Uh, I think she's in there four days a week. And uh, just I get nothing but positive feedback she from folks. She is very knowledgeable. Uh, you know, she knows that product. She knows how to get you enrolled. You know, all there's a ton of hoops you have to jump through to get into some of these programs. And it can be overwhelming for folks who aren't used to that. So, you know, she has that ability. She's very calm. She's very polite knows how to get you through that process, helps walk you through all those pages of forms you need to fill out to get you into those enrolled into the insurance programs. Any uh, consideration about the Affordable Care Act as we look forward to 2018? Where's it going to be? How are we going to do it? Will we still have the same or maintain what we've had for 2017? I think right now, from our budget perspective, we're saying we're going to maintain what we saw in 2017, other than knowing some folks are dropping off because the product is just not available in Indiana. So, Allowing a little more dollars probably for write-offs for, you know, those uh, compassionate care or the bad debts for folks who just can't pay. I think from the you know, those who are still in there and in the governmental programs, I think it's going to stay pretty well the same. We're, we're seeing not as quite of much of a push from the government to, you know, 
create new problems for us as far as, you know, like the new infrastructure for the IT. That was something that was put in two years ago. It was delayed. It was supposed to go into effect uh, January 2017. They delayed it, said, nope, we're actually, you got to do it January 2018. So I'm hoping I don't, you know, next week they call and say, oh, never mind, don't have to do it since I've already signed the contract, you know, to update that system. But, you know, it, it's, uh, I think we're not seeing quite as much of those requirements where they're wanting us to be able to communicate with every hospital, every physician practice in the country. And, and early on, that's what they wanted. They wanted a, a universal medical record that wherever you went, it was, you could get it electronically. Which makes sense to a degree. It makes sense to a degree. The The issue, though, is you know you count how many hospitals are. That's how many different healthcare software systems right. there is out there. And trying to get all these systems to communicate with each other, and they all have proprietary uh, you know coding in those, so they don't talk together very well. We're seeing a little bit of, of that push of everything being compatible. Not quite as bad. I think what we're seeing is some folks finally realize we've, tried to bite off more than we can chew. It's an impossible task. I agree we need to have more uh, ability to transfer these records. So, you know, the folks do to go to Florida in the winter, we can get those records down there. But it, it, it sh they were making it so hard that it was impossible for it to do. Give us some leeway. Let us figure it out. The healthcare providers, we can figure it out much easier than if the government tries to tell us, here's how you have to do it, because they seem to always find the hardest way to do things, unfortunately. <laughs> That's because they're not involved in it on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. They're, they're not involved with it. So uh, we're seeing a little bit of, of a turn back of some of those regulations, but we're still moving forward. And I think 2017 is going to be pretty close, or 2018 is going to be real close to what we saw in 2017. John, we've had a lot of warm weather days, which is nice for early fall or late fall or whatever you want to call it so far. I'm curious as to what that does to flu. Does it mean that we seem to have more cases of flu or not? I, I don't see a correlation between the weather okay. and flu. I think it's just, you know, one of those things, once that bug starts, it, passes does, from person it to person. doesn't care if it's warm or cold. It, you know, it's one of those that just passes very quickly. You know, we haven't seen quite as many cases this time this year as we have in the past. A lot of people, well, because it's warm weather. I think we're just, we're not cooped up. You know, at, when the right. weather's warm, people are out moving around more, so we're not as confined. So those germs aren't being easily passed. They're still there. We're just not confined in a, a small area to make it real easy for those little burgers to get from one, <laughs> one person to the other. Approaching the end of the year, are you satisfied with where Woodlawn is doctor-wise? Yeah, I, I think we've got a fairly good complement of doctors that meets the needs of our community. Uh, however, it doesn't preclude me from still I need to look, because I know I've got some physicians next three to five years are going to be retiring. And, and it takes three to four years to recruit a physician into the community. Um, once I get them here and get them to look at the community, the, the town, right. and our facility, they like it. But it's, uh, you know, they all want to be in that major metropolitan area, and uh, we just don't have that. So, you know, we have to do a pretty good sell job on folks saying, you know, you have access to the, the metropolitan with Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, South Bend, Chicago. They can, you know, jump on the train and be downtown Chicago very quickly. Once they kind of see that, uh, yeah, they're not out in the middle of nowhere, it's a little easier to get them uh, convinced to come to our facility. We've been talking to a couple students who's in their final year of residency at, uh, uh, through the IU Health okay. System at Ball Memorial. They're interested in what they call rural medicine. It's a husband-wife team. Uh, so they've been in contact with us, and uh, I think their graduation is July or August of 2018. So they're still interested in coming to Woodlawn. So we'll be talking to those, you know, those two young folks, bringing them, hopefully can bring them on board and, you know, start preparing for those physicians that I know in three or four years are going to be retiring. And I'd much rather have a physician in place now that they can ease into the practice than all of a sudden say, okay, I've got a doctor retired. I need somebody immediately. Right. It makes for a much smoother transition by having that where they can share knowledge. I mean, our physicians have got years and years of knowledge that they can pass on to some of the younger doctors who, yeah, they're, they're coming straight out of residency, but they haven't seen what a, a person who's got 15, 20 years under their belt allows them to help mentor them and make them a better physician long term. John, are the med schools putting out enough doctors now? No. Uh, <laughs> you, notice how long, answer. you notice how long I had to think about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I noticed. I, you know, there's still a, a fairly large uh, physician shortage, and we're seeing that improve. But, you know, a lot of the schools have a number. They will only accept so many students into the medical uh, field. Uh, we need to see some of that eased and so we can get some more physicians in because, you know, I'm not the only one experienced a lot of their seasoned, very, very good physicians you know, in their late 60s, and they're saying, I'm tired. I want to retire. So we're going to have, you know, 
30 go out, but there's only going to be three to take their place. So we're seeing that shortage started. Um, you know, a lot of the physicians don't want to go into family practice. They, they like to be an, an ologist mm -hmm. of some sort because no nights, no weekends. You know, they work Monday through Friday, you know, 8 to 5, and that's it. Where a family practice doc is far more committed. I mean, they, they have a lot of nights, a lot of weekends. They're on call. It's just a different type of medicine. So we're, we're not seeing as many of the young students go into family practice. They're wanting to be a specialist. So I think we're still going to experience a shortage of that. We need the, the schools to, you know, put out some more docs. There needs to be more incentives, I think, from the government and from the schools to say, if you commit to go into family practice in a rural setting, you know, maybe they're going to uh, waive 30% of their student fees. You know, I mean, there's got to be creative ways to try to incentivize uh, the good doctors, family practice in the rural areas. Capital expenditures for Woodlawn in 2018? That is going to be approved by the board next month. Okay. Uh, we're required every year to come up with a three-year capital budget by the uh, Medicare. They want to know, what are you planning on doing? So right now, the preliminary one that we uh, give to the board yesterday... We're looking probably about a 1.3, 1.6 million of capital improvements. And what we like to do is keep on the front edge of, of our infrastructure. And the worst thing that happens is have a piece of the equipment break. I'd rather we replace it before it breaks so we're, we don't have you know extended downtime. And then so, find out there's no service for it anymore. Are there, yes, or it's, it's old enough we can't get parts for it. So our maintenance department works very hard to try to predict you know, what from that infrastructure we're going to need. The departments look at their equipment, too, and say, okay, this one's eight years old. It's still working, but I'm getting to the end of its useful life, and we start talking to the, you know, the, the repair people. I can't get parts for that anymore. That's our red flag. Say, if you're telling me next year there's no parts available for this machine, then we need to replace it because we know the moment we don't replace that, it's going to break. So that's what we do in our capital. And then we look, you know, 2019, 2020. Mm. We extend this out so we can kind of get an idea as we move forward, where do we need to focus on infrastructure improvements, our capital improvements. Finally, John, you mentioned the board approved the 2018 budget. Is it similar to the 2017 budget? It's very close. We use the 2017 as the template for 2018. Okay. Um, you know, when we historically look uh, over the past five years, we don't see a lot of variation in uh, number of patients we see. So we kind of use that as our baseline. We know there's cost increases for our supplies. So we usually will put in a, anywhere on normal supplies, probably a 3 to 4% increase in cost for supplies. Pharmaceuticals, that's the one that's killing us right now. We're looking at 12 to 18% increase there. And now we have uh, major shortages of probably about 40% of the drugs that we use every day. We're being told they're not available. Uh, they're, you know, the hurricane that hit Puerto Rico mm -hmm. wiped out a lot of the distribution points. So it's going to take a long time to get that rebuilt, those distribution points, get it back in the, the what pipeline. Do you do? Well, you, you try to find alternatives okay. if you can. Um, you know, uh, the other thing that kind of amazed me, the, the IV bags, the plastic that goes, we can't find those. <laughs> the manufacturer is uh, down for whatever reason, so they're not making the plastic, and it's a special type of plastic for IV bags. So all of a sudden, we use it, millions of those. We can't get them. So now we're struggling. You can get maybe a, a 100 milliliter. Well, only we need a 25. So we're wasting because we have to use 100. We have to have something. So that's, that's being wasted. There's not a, a way, and we're not allowed to say, well, can I take... A 100 and make 425s out of it. Can't do it. Right. Because, you know, infection control issues, which I'm okay with that. Let's make it safe for the patient. So we're becoming very uh, creative in how we're doing some of this stuff. Make sure we ensure patient safety, but still get them what they need. Purchasing goes home every night with a headache. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> in January, he had coal black hair. Today, it's snow white. Uh, you know, Jim Truman's my director of materials, and uh, every time I go down there, he's pulling his hair out because he's trying to find this stuff. Same thing with our pharmacist. You know, they spend probably, right now, 40% of his day is on the phone calling every supplier he knows, do you have any of this? And, uh, you know, well, I've got two. We'll take them. Whereas before, you know, we were getting cases of this. We're only getting ones and twos. And the other part, what used to cost us $2 a unit is now $200 a unit. Because if we want it, you're going to pay for it. So, uh, you know, it's, to me, sometimes that's a little on the verge of price gouging <laughs> uh but you know we got to get it well, we see a lot of stories about that frankly yeah and uh, unfortunately there are folks out there that take advantage of these shortages but you know we're uh, we're finding alternatives we're working with the medical staff uh you know we keep them informed daily of, of what new drug is now on shortage you say okay you've always used x 
can you use why? So we're getting a lot of feedback from our medical staff saying it's not the best, but yes, we can use that in our treatment. To, you know, uh, So we're getting very creative. Uh, they're doing an excellent job between materials, pharmacy, and the physicians working very closely together to make sure that we, we do not have a critical item that we just can't get. We're, we're finding alternatives. John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital, as always, uh, keep up the good work. Keep uh, Fulton County and the surrounding area healthy, will you please? We're doing the best we can. Uh, you know, like I've always said, surround myself with outstanding people. It makes my <laughs> job real easy. John Alley, thanks very much. Thank you.